My marriage broke up and it just ceased to exist and there are many reasons for this but the most important reason is betrayal, which destroyed the foundation of the marriage and it can no longer be restored. The worst thing is that I have made considerable efforts to erase my marriage. Hi, Mike. Hello, Carol, I replied, turning to face her. My eyes couldn't help but briefly admire the attractive woman before me, especially her slim figure. How's little Tim? He's doing well this morning, the young mother in front of me smiled. He's over his cold now. How's Mary? Just as beautiful as ever, I grinned, glancing at my baby daughter, though I might be a bit biased. I don't think so. Carol chimed in, settling down beside me. But she's lucky to have a father like you after what her mother did. It all began almost two years earlier. That's when my troubles started because up until then my wife Janet and I had enjoyed what appeared to be a perfectly normal and happy married life. Of course, assuming that a happy marriage is considered normal. For a while, I began to doubt that. We had met a few years prior through mutual connections. Janet was friends with Martha, who had gone to school with my sister Julie. We first encountered each other at a party in Manchester where we both lived, and immediately clicked. I suppose we both had our own charms and seemed well suited from the outset. Janet had a slender yet curvaceous figure, a combination that may sound contradictory, but she carried it off incredibly well. Her long, glossy, jet-black hair and sparkling, deep blue eyes only added to her allure. I'll admit I probably had to put in more effort than she did initially to establish ourselves as a couple. But once we did, everything seemed perfect. Neither of us were strangers to previous relationships when we met, so we each brought our past experiences into the bedroom, resulting in a pretty intense connection. She introduced me to experiences I had never imagined possible, and early on I decided not to question where she had learned such things. After all, I was benefiting, and Janet, to her credit, never questioned me either. Things progressed and it seemed like all our friends were getting married. We were around that age, late twenties to early thirties, and feeling ready to settle down. I eventually proposed to Janet, and she agreed without hesitation as I expected. We were practically living together already, so it was just a matter of a quick trip to the local registry office with close family and friends, followed by a big celebration that evening at our favorite local spot. We were too tipsy from gin and tonics to consummate the marriage that night, but Janet didn't seem to mind much. Marriage didn't change much in our daily lives. We still worked, partied, dined out, and enjoyed our intimate moments not necessarily in that order. My ongoing challenge was being an Arsenal fan living in Manchester. Dealing with United or City supporters was a constant struggle. Believe it or not, there were even people there who faithfully attended Stockport County matches every week. Yes, unbelievable. I could understand Bolton Wanderers or maybe Wigan, but Stockport? Really? The situation wasn't helped by Janet and her entire family being die-hard Manchester United fans. Her dad would just shake his head whenever we discussed which football club our future children might support. So life continued happily, and over the years Janet and I grew closer. I was her zing, and she certainly reciprocated at least three times a week in bed. I distinctly recall the beginning of football season when I sensed things weren't quite right. I was fine, but Janet appeared somewhat withdrawn and occasionally irritable. I couldn't quite pinpoint why, so I attributed it to her monthly cycle. That's what us guys tend to do, isn't it? When everything we say seems wrong and intimacy wanes for a few days? But her mood seemed to linger longer than usual, and if I hadn't been so occupied with work, perhaps I might have noticed some warning signs. Nonetheless, I planned to have a serious conversation with her that Sunday, but fate intervened and I never got the chance. On Saturday, we attended a party at a local club that would change my life forever. It was an engagement party for someone Janet worked with, though I can't recall who exactly, only that both Janet and I were invited. The place was packed. I had to wait in line to get our drinks and they weren't even complimentary. 
some lousy engagement party. No wonder they chose to have it at a club instead of their home. Cheeky people. Returning to our table, I carefully carried a couple of beers for myself and Todd, Martha's husband, and G&Ts for our wives. Where are the ladies? I asked Todd, not spotting them anywhere. They're off dancing with some old friends of theirs, he replied casually, unconcerned. We struggled to chat over the loud music, mostly discussing the results of the afternoon's big games. Both Arsenal and United had won, so there was no contention, and time slipped by unnoticed. Hey, guys, Martha greeted as she returned to the table. Is this my drink? Yes, I said, pausing my discussion on the flaws of the 442 formation. Where's Janet? Oh, she's still out there dancing, Martha replied, quickly changing the subject. Too quickly. Dancing with whom? I asked, suddenly interested. She's been out there dancing for quite a while. Just an old friend, Mike, Martha shot back. Nothing to be upset about. Who said anything about being upset? I retorted. Why would I be upset? No reason, Mike, absolutely none. It's just someone Janet hasn't seen in a while. Should that have raised some alarms, perhaps? It was hard to tell, but I leaned back in my chair and took a gulp of my beer, trying to pretend I wasn't concerned, even though my stomach was already in knots. After another ten minutes and a couple of changes in music, I was getting increasingly uneasy. Martha had whispered something to Todd a couple of times, and both of them were actively avoiding eye contact with me, almost as if I wasn't there. Come on, you two, I finally asked in frustration. What's going on here? Who is this friend of hers? Maybe you should go find her, Mike, Todd suggested, ignoring Martha's disapproving glares. No! Martha suddenly interjected, jumping up and handing me my half-empty pint. No need, Mike. I'll go find her for you. Ah, there was definitely something going on, and I demanded of Todd what exactly the girls were up to. Oh, just some footballer they used to know, Todd replied, sounding uncertain. I think he played for United as a junior, but didn't quite make it, and has been playing up north in one of the lower divisions. They both knew him? I asked, my throat tightening as I stood up, determined to find out what was really going on. I think Janet knew him better than Martha, Todd admitted cautiously, holding onto my arm. Don't do anything rash, Mike. I'm sure Janet isn't up to anything wrong. Well, I'll see for myself, Todd, I growled, shaking off his hand, wondering if this footballer had anything to do with Janet's strange behavior lately. But I didn't get far. Not at all. Here she is, Mike, Martha announced excitedly as she approached us, dragging Janet along. No harm done. Janet and I exchanged silent glances for a few moments. The room around us seemed to quiet down. She stood there, making no move to sit down or offer any apologies or explanations. Who is he? I finally demanded. Where did this guy come from? What business is it of yours? Janet snapped back. Who are you to dictate who I spend time with? I'm your husband, I reminded her, raising my voice. You better remember that. Husband, she spat. Husband, maybe you should remember that I'm your wife. What are you talking about, Janet? What's gotten into you? I was shouting now, utterly confused, and people nearby were starting to take notice of the argument. You didn't think about your wife when you were with the Jennifer Meadows, did you? Janet screamed at me. I tried to respond, but words failed me. How did she know about Jennifer and me? See? Janet accused. You don't even deny it, you bastard. Janet, honey, I began trying to explain. Me, Jennifer and I were... But I couldn't finish my sentence as Janet cut me off. Janet blamed me harshly. You were close to that woman, weren't you? Yes, darling, I replied almost automatically, stunned by her insistence. But... No excuses, you lying jerk, Janet interrupted. I know what you've been doing with her, and I won't stand for it. But, honey, it's not what you think. Oh, no, why did I say that stupid thing? Well, go to hell, you idiot, Janet yelled loud enough for everyone nearby to hear. It's over between us, and from now on... 
You can be with Jennifer Meadows as long as you want. Listen, Janet, I began, reaching out to her. But before I could continue, she grabbed a glass of beer and threw it at me. I was too close to dodge, and he hit me right in the temple, stunning me. Damn you, she screamed and ran away, and Martha followed her, calling for her to stop. Jesus, Mike, exclaimed Todd, getting up and helping me wipe the beer. Jennifer Meadows, she's amazing, man, but have you seen her husband? I know her husband, Todd, I replied, tidying myself up, and he already knows about me and his wife. Todd looked surprised, but I didn't have much chance to explain further. Across the room, what appeared to be a catfight erupted among women, with screaming and chaos ensuing. Tables and chairs were tossed around, creating quite a scene. Under different circumstances, I might have been concerned or even amused, but given my current state, I simply stood and watched. Jesus, Mike, Todd interrupted. That's your Janet over there, fighting with some blonde. That's Jennifer Meadows. Christ it is, Mike, Todd muttered. Looks like it's over now, though. Oh, shit. What a mess. How could a couple of nights in bed with Jennifer have led to this? What's the matter, Mike? Despite holding my head in my hands, I could discern the sharp words of yet another furious woman yelling at me. All I wanted in that moment was to escape. But life, especially my life, has never been that simple. Hello, Jennifer. How are you? I managed to say, given my state. How am I? Jennifer Meadows shouted back, with her imposing husband Fred looming behind her. What have you been telling that foolish Janet? Nothing, I insisted, keeping an eye on Fred. I tried to explain, but... She said we were having an affair, Mike, Jennifer interrupted. She claimed you confessed it to her. I gulped. Fred, looking visibly uncomfortable, was not a good sign. What's going on, Mike? Jennifer demanded. She didn't let me explain, Jennifer. I squeezed in when she paused. She asked if we'd slept together, and I admitted it before I could think. But that was years ago, Mike, Jennifer exploded. We dated before I met Fred, and you were with Janet by then. I know, I murmured, but she didn't give me a chance to clarify that. I glanced up at Fred and saw a half-smile on his face. Thankfully, he already knew about Jennifer and me dating for a few months before he showed up. Fred was a massive guy, towering over us. What a foolish woman Janet is, Jennifer remarked, then let out a squeal. What's wrong? I asked, looking around, half expecting my furious wife to charge at us with a broom or something. It's your face, Mike, she exclaimed, finally noticing, I assumed, that I was still dripping with beer. Janet threw a glass of beer at me, Jennifer, I explained, trying to act like it didn't bother me. But what about all this blood? Blood? Oh my goodness. Where did the blood come from? The cold liquid, I had felt, trickling down my face earlier now felt warm. Blood was everywhere, dripping onto the table and even into my beer. What a terrible mess. People started fussing around me, women leaning in to wipe my face with napkins and such. The glass must have shattered when it hit me. Good grief. What a colossal disaster. Within 20 minutes, I found myself in the emergency ward of the local hospital, checked in by a stern-faced nurse in scrubs who could pass for a dragon. Been in a fight, have you? She accused me, her expression one of disdain. It wasn't surprising, considering the chaos around me in the emergency room. Well, it was a Saturday night, I replied. No, I continued. The wife did this. You probably had it coming, she retorted curtly, moving on to the next patient. So much for the NHS, but they did patch me up in the end. Several stitches and a couple of hours later, Fred, of all people, drove me home. Home to a cold and empty place. No sign of Janet. God, what a complete mess. I attempted to call her mobile, but without success. All I received was her voicemail greeting. Sorry, Janet Morris is not available, etc., etc. That wasn't helpful at all, 
and you can imagine how frustrated I felt. I went to bed, but you can guess how little sleep I actually managed to get that night. What little I did get. Morning came, sunshine, a shower, tea, and a light breakfast. I couldn't eat much as my stomach was in knots. Then I heard a buzz from my phone. I walked over wearily to where I'd left it the night before, not eager for the conversation I knew was coming. It turned out to be a text message, and I'm sure you can guess who it was from. You are a cheating bastard F off. Lovely, right? Where are you? I texted back. Getting my revenge, came the reply, and I felt my breakfast threaten to come back up. I desperately tried calling her to talk, to stop Janet from making a terrible mistake. But once again, it went to voicemail, even though I knew she had her phone with her. Then it hit me. It was 9.30 in the morning, and my dear wife had been gone all night. With a sickening realization, I feared it might be too late to prevent what I dreaded. Images of Janet, perhaps at that very moment, with some idiot footballer, a second division one at that, flashed before my eyes. Oh, no. Despite my efforts, I couldn't stop the rest of my breakfast from spilling again. And this time, I didn't bother trying to catch it. It made a bloody mess on the carpet, which took hours to clean up later. I was uncertain about what to do next. I attempted to call Martha on her mobile, but there was no answer. When I dialed their landline, I felt relieved when Fred picked up. How's it going, Mike? He asked. Terribly, I replied, explaining about the text messages. Martha went over to talk some sense into her, Fred continued. They had a heated argument earlier on the phone. Where is she, Fred? I asked quietly. Where did Janet spend the night? I promised Martha I wouldn't say, he responded unhappily. That pretty much tells me where she was, I probed. Yeah, I guess so, Fred confirmed, but it doesn't mean she slept with him or anything. Who is this guy, Fred? I asked, dismissing his suggestion. What's his name? I don't really know him, Fred replied cautiously. His name's Nick Masters or something like that. He got transferred to Stockport a few weeks ago. Stockport? Stockport? I don't have anything against Stockport, but my goodness. Anyway, hearing the name Nick was enough for me. I had never met him, and Janet had never mentioned him before. But her mother? Ah, yes. Yes, she had mentioned Nick a few times in the early days, before she realized Janet was serious about me. She even called me Nick by mistake a couple of times, but I brushed it off then. Suddenly, everything made sense. Nick had obviously returned to the area a few weeks earlier. Around the same time, Janet started acting distant with me. Around the same time, our intimacy faded. I couldn't believe Janet would cheat on me, but all signs pointed to it. What should I do? What could I do? The obvious choice, of course. She was cheating. I leaped up and stormed up the stairs, bursting into our bedroom like a possessed man. Grabbing the first suitcase I found in the closet, I yanked open Janet's drawers and began stuffing handfuls of blouses and things inside. I would show her. I angrily tossed the drawer aside and opened the next one, grabbing more clothes. Underwear, lace underwear, they are all attractive. To be honest, I couldn't help myself. I stopped and looked at them, remembering how amazing Janet looked in those clothes. I remember how she liked to tease me by walking around the house in her underwear and high heels. I remembered just a few months ago when she greeted me at the door in barely anything, the same scanty pieces I now held in my hand. That's when the first tear clouded my vision. Despite my efforts to wipe it away, it lingered. They say you only realize the importance of something after you've lost it, don't they? In that moment, it hit me hard how much I love Janet and how deeply I would miss her if she left me or if I ended things which seemed like the path I was on. She had betrayed me, and I had to face that reality. But who had told her I was cheating? Who had suggested I was involved with Jennifer Meadows? I had no idea. Would it have made a difference anyway? Maybe I was just grasping at straws. I sadly watched as the underwear slipped from my hand back into the drawer. I slumped onto the bed, 
letting tears flow freely, and started to grasp the true meaning of profound despair, realizing my once joyful life lay in ruins. I remained seated for some time afterward, possibly hours, when the phone rang once more. Yes, it had rung a few times earlier, and I had chosen to ignore it. Hello, I answered with little enthusiasm. Hello, Mike, it's me, honey, came the voice from the other end of the line. I've been trying to reach you, sweetheart. I've been out, Janet, I lied, unwilling to admit that I had been sitting there crying my eyes out for half the day. It seems I made a terrible mistake, Mike, Janet murmured into the phone. Martha told me what happened later, and I've spoken to Jennifer and apologized. So what now, Janet? I challenged her. Where do we stand? Well, I hope. I mean, oh my God, Mike. I suppose you know about Nick. That he plays football for bloody Stockport or that you spent the night in bed with him. There was a long silence on the line. Oh, I'm so sorry, Mike, she finally continued. I do love you, honey, and I hate myself for hurting you like this. I've been awful. So you slept with him then? I accused. I don't want to talk about it on the phone, honey. Janet gulped, clearly on the verge of tears. Can I come over and see you? Not right now, Janet, I replied, recalling the mess still on the living room floor. Give me an hour or so. Okay, honey, she replied, and this time I could hear her sobbing. I'll be there around eight this evening. Oh, God, what a terrible job. Ever cleaned vomit off a carpet before? No. Then I wouldn't recommend trying it. I had to rush to the toilet twice before I managed to get it looking and smelling decent. And then I had to clean myself up in the same way. I wasn't looking forward to our meeting at all, still unsure how to handle it. Sure, I wanted my wife back, but I needed to know who had filled her head with all that nonsense, and someone would pay for it. But even that wasn't straightforward, was it? If Janet had made just one mistake and it was truly a slip-up, I thought I could forgive her. People make mistakes, and I wanted her back enough to overlook it. But... She'd been distant for two weeks or more. Had she been seeing this Nick guy behind my back all that time? Had they been having an affair? I had no clue, and guessing wouldn't help. I just hoped that by that night, everything would be okay between us again. Eight o'clock came and went, and I was a bundle of nerves. The phone rang, that cursed phone again. Martha greeted me over the phone. Hi, Mike, it's Martha. Hi, Martha, I replied. I'm just waiting for Janet to arrive. Thanks for talking to her. I'm afraid Janet won't make it tonight, Mike, Martha said abruptly. I've been on the phone with her for an hour, and she's in a terrible state. Why? I asked, though I knew it was futile. She's so confused, Mike. She's devastated about what she's done to you and unsure if you'll take her back. She's a mess right now. I guess she brought it on herself, I admitted. But I don't want to lose her, Martha. I love her. I know you do, Mike, Martha comforted me. I'm sure you'll work things out. Janet asked me to tell you that she'll come over to talk tomorrow after work. Her mom will bring her. That old dragon, I thought silently, then thanked Martha for informing me. So Janet's staying at her parents tonight. I asked, crossing my fingers for reassurance. I suppose so, Mike. That was all I could cling to. I felt empty and tempted to call her parents' house, but uncertainty held me back. What if she refused to talk? Worse, what if she wasn't even there? Oh, no. I reassured myself that everything would be all right tomorrow, eventually crawling into bed. The half-bottle of wine I had downed helped me drift into a troubled sleep. Put aside thoughts of tomorrow at work. Actually, just put it all out of your mind. I didn't get fired or anything, but the boss was definitely displeased with me. Go home, Mike, he told me halfway through the afternoon. You're not doing any good here. I think he understood I was dealing with family issues, and I recall he had a tough time himself the previous year. Sort out whatever it is, Mike. 
don't make a rash decision you'll regret forever. So I went home, only to find myself wishing I was back at work, where I could at least keep my mind occupied. The call from Martha was a welcome distraction. She wished me luck and advised me not to act impulsively, but to give Janet time to explain everything. It seemed everyone wanted my marriage to continue, including Janet. It looked like the decision was up to me, so I resolved to try to forgive and move forward. Forgetting? Well, that wouldn't be easy. But I felt forgiveness was possible. No, easy isn't the right word. Janet was my life. We were even discussing starting a family a few weeks ago, weren't we? We had some doubts for a while, but, well, just, just but. My heart skipped a beat when I heard the car arrive, prompting me to peek out the window and witness Janet and her rather unpleasant mother stepping out. They glanced nervously at the house, and I'm certain Janet muttered something angrily at her mother. I hoped Janet wouldn't ring the bell or do anything foolish, but shortly after they entered, finding me waiting. Hello, Mike, Janet cautiously ventured. Are you okay? I remained silent, just shrugged, and nodded in acceptance. Janet's face softened into a small smile and she hurried over, wrapping me in a tight embrace. Oh, Mike, I'm so sorry. Truly sorry, she cried. I was foolish to believe what others were saying. It's okay, sweetheart, I replied, returning her embrace, knowing that starting to heal wouldn't be easy. Could you give us some time alone, please? I asked her mother, who still stood there scowling. I think Janet and I need to talk. I think I should stay and... She began, but Janet cut her off. Please, Mum, don't make this harder. Mike needs us alone right now. Her mother grimaced, then reluctantly left the room. I couldn't understand why she still blamed me, though that seemed to be her stance. Our conversation began much as I expected. I can't apologize enough, Mike, for how much I must have hurt you, Janet started. I should have talked to you before making such a stupid mistake in public. Who filled your head with those lies, Janet? I asked. But she refused to tell me, though I saw her glance toward the door where her mother had left, before quickly returning her gaze to me. So that's it, huh? The cow. Why did her mother hate me so much? I decided this wasn't the end of it. The moment for reconciliation didn't feel right. I'd wait for my chance. I'd find out and that troublemaker would pay. Can you forgive me, honey? Janet pleaded, tears in her eyes. I need to know what I'm forgiving, Janet, I replied. You slept with him, didn't you? Yes, Mike, she whispered against my chest. And I suspect it wasn't the first time? No, Mike, Janet shot back. I swear last night was the first time since years ago when we were together. But you've been meeting him, haven't you? I accused. Yes, she admitted quietly. Lunches and a few after-work meetings. And you kissed him, didn't you? I scowled. No, Mike, Janet pleaded. I told you I didn't. Just some kissing, nothing more. But why, Janet? I asked, almost in tears myself. I need to understand. What's wrong with me? Don't you love me? Of course I love you, Mike, she cried in despair. But that's the problem, can't you see? See what? I demanded. If you love me, why did you turn to another man? Janet hesitated, then shattered my hope completely. I love Nick too, Mike. Can't you see I've never stopped loving him? Years ago, I should have gone with him up north when he asked. It was only Mum who stopped me then, and I didn't take another man seriously until I met you. What? What the hell are you saying? I yelled, pushing her away, my mind struggling to comprehend her words. I'm sorry, Mike, but you needed to know she cried, tears streaming down her face. I do love you, but I love Nick too, and I always have. Nick. Well, Nick is Nick, and we were meant to be together. What are you saying? I managed to choke out, disbelief and pain gripping my chest. I'm sorry, honey, Janet sobbed, now openly weeping. I'm not coming home. I can't. I have to try to be with Nick now that he's back. It's how it's supposed to be. I stood there in shock, unable to utter a word, my heart racing, 
feeling like I might collapse from the weight of her revelation. I couldn't believe it. While I'd been searching my heart to forgive my wife, all this time my beloved Janet had been planning to leave me for another man. At that moment, the door burst open and the dragon stormed in. Have you caused enough trouble already? She yelled at me. Look, I hope you're satisfied now. You've made my daughter cry. Mum, Janet sobbed. Please don't get involved. None of this would have happened if he hadn't shown up, the dragon continued relentlessly. You took her away from me and from Nick. Mom, just stop it, Janet screamed at her. Even better, I interjected, starting to regain my composure. You can get out of my house, you meddling old woman. You can't speak to me like that, the old woman shot back. But I took her by the arm and marched her forcefully to the front door where I pushed her out and slammed it in her face. I'm sorry about Mum, Janet said sadly. I'm sorry about everything, Mike. I think you should leave too, Janet, I told my supposed wife firmly. Nick will be missing you. But we need to sort things out, Mike, Janet argued. I can't just leave you like this. You've already left me once, Janet, I reminded her angrily. I don't need your sympathy. But I want to help you, Mike she cried. I want to make you understand. I don't want your help, Janet, I spat at her. I understand perfectly well that you've cheated on me and now you're leaving me for someone else. Please, Mike, she sobbed softly. Please let me. No, Janet, I yelled, reaching my breaking point. If you want to do something for me, just go. Janet broke down in tears again burying her face in her hands. Can you ever forgive me, Mike? She asked, her voice trembling with tears. Can you forgive me for what I've done to you? Yes, you're forgiven if that's what you want. I lied through gritted teeth. Now please leave my house and let me try to move on with my life. Janet moved closer, perhaps to kiss me goodbye, but I backed away and raised my hand to stop her. I may forgive you, Janet, I cried out in pain, but I can't let you touch me again. Janet visibly crumpled, turned slowly, and walked out of the house, her cries echoing as she disappeared from my life. Or so I believed at the time. I have no recollection of what happened over the next few days as I fell into a deep depression. From being a happily married man thinking about starting a family, I suddenly became a desolate soul in just a matter of days. It all became too overwhelming, and I turned to alcohol as a means of escape, though deep down I knew it wasn't a solution. I'd rather not dwell on that bleak week, but with the support of a few friends I managed to persevere. Even my boss showed understanding, likely because I excelled at my job. You see, can you see what was happening to me? Predictably. I was becoming cynical. Our circle of friends seemed divided, despite many of them knowing Janet longer than me. Quite a few stood by my side. They never mentioned her directly in my presence, except for the occasional slip. A painful curiosity inside me yearned to learn more about Nick, but I couldn't muster the courage to inquire. One evening I even attended a Stockport football match and witnessed that bastard come on as a substitute in the second half scoring a goal to tie the game. I still knew very little about him, but I had to admit he was a skilled footballer. I wondered if Janet was there in the crowd that night, scanning the boxes to catch a glimpse of her. But there was no sign of her. Perhaps it was all too distant. That night I left the stadium feeling utterly despondent, beyond words to describe. That guy had outplayed me and all I could envision was Janet happily embracing him after his triumph on the field. I doubted she spared a single thought for me. I wasn't ready to date again or anything close. It would take a long time to feel okay with that part of my life. Divorce hadn't crossed my mind, nor did it seem worthwhile. If she wanted to marry the jerk, let her do the legwork while he footed the bill. He probably made enough as a pro footballer, even if it was just Stockport. Life moved on. Then, about three weeks after we split, around nine at night, my dismal evening was interrupted by a knock on the door. Opening it, I was stunned to find Janet standing there. What do you want? 
I asked sharply. Can I come in, please, Mike? She asked quietly. I hesitated, but stepped aside, following her into the living room, my thoughts swirling. Janet was the last person I expected to see. Damn it. Why did she have to look so damn stunning? So what is it that you want, then? I repeated firmly, noticing Janet's distressed expression. Perhaps he had kicked her out or something. Maybe that was too much to hope for. Did I really wish for that to happen? Can I please have a cup of tea, honey? Janet asked quietly. Are you sure you're planning to stay that long, Janet? I retorted sharply. Won't Nick be missing you? And I'm not your honey anymore unless you've forgotten. Please, Mike, don't be mean to me, she pleaded, twisting her hands together. Nick doesn't know I'm here, but we need to talk about something important. I have nothing to talk about with you, Janet, I told her, my heart breaking. Please, Mike, don't make this difficult. We really do need to talk. Reluctantly, I went to the kitchen and prepared two mugs of tea. It felt like old times, but of course it was nothing like that at all. I stood there waiting for the kettle to boil, wondering what on earth Janet wanted from me this time. Could it be a divorce? Was this going to be the moment? So what is it that we need to discuss, Janet? I demanded, handing her the mug of tea. I can't imagine there's much left to sort out. I'm pregnant, Mike. She blurted out, dropping her head into her hands. Well, that was quick, I responded sharply. You've only been with him for a few weeks. It's not Nick's baby, Mike. What? It's not Nick's, Mike. But, uh, but, uh, I don't understand. I'm almost three months along, Mike, Janet continued, almost in a whisper. It couldn't be Nick's. He only came back a couple of months ago. It has to be yours. You're the father of my baby, Mike. Oh, bloody hell. What have I done to deserve this? Let's be frank. At that moment, you wouldn't have wanted to trade places with me, would you? What would you have done? The woman I simultaneously despised and loved was carrying my child. Yes. Without a doubt, it was my child. Did I tell her to leave as I was tempted to do? Or did I react differently, as I truly desired? I was utterly confused. Initially, we just stood there staring at each other. I was contemplating my words while Janet awaited my response with uncertainty. Well? Janet finally asked. I'm not sure what to say, I replied. Are you happy? She cautiously inquired. Should I be? I countered. We had plans to start a family, Mike, she continued cautiously. Before, well, you know, before everything happened. But what does this mean for us now, Janet? I asked, the obvious question. It's your call, Mike, Janet struggled to say, whether you want to take me back or not. And Nick, your boyfriend. What about him? I demanded, feeling indignant at her audacity. Where does he fit into all of this? Nick doesn't want kids, Mike. He's made that very clear, especially not someone else's. Does he even know about the baby? I asked, wondering if he had already kicked her out. Does anyone else know? No, Mike, she replied honestly. I wanted to tell you first. My feelings for Nick haven't changed since I've been away, Mike. But I've missed you terribly. Not a day has gone by that I haven't thought of you. But he's still your first choice? I questioned. Maybe. But you and our baby change everything. I'll give him up if I have to. My mind was racing as we sat there, silently gazing at each other once more. I understood that things could never return to how they were. But perhaps they could be okay, at least. And the baby. That was the deciding factor. I couldn't bear to abandon my own unborn child. All right, Janet, I conceded. You can move back in if you want, but not into my bedroom. For now, you'll sleep in the spare room and we'll see how it goes. Oh, thank you, Mike, darling, Janet exclaimed, jumping up and hurrying over to me. 
I knew you wouldn't let me down. You'll see. Everything will work out for the best. I turned my head to offer my cheek when she tried to kiss me, which surprised her. But she ended up on my lap with her arms around my neck. I wanted to push her away, but I couldn't bring myself to do it. Having her there just felt so right again. Janet eagerly expressed her intention to move back in with Mike sometime the following week, seeking his approval. Little did she know what awaited her. I'll move in next week if that's okay with you, Mike, Janet excitedly said. But she was in for a surprise. You either move in right now or not at all, I informed her firmly. I'm not going to sit at home for a week waiting for you while you're with him. But what about Nick? Janet asked anxiously. I need to talk to him, Mike. I can't just leave him. Just like you left me? I snapped at her, causing her to drop her gaze. These are my conditions, Janet. Move back here immediately. Don't see him. Don't call him. Don't tell him you're pregnant. Actually, don't tell anyone you're pregnant until we can't hide it anymore. But Mike, I can't do that. What will Nick think? Janet pleaded. Hopefully he'll think what I want him to think, that you left him to come back to me. I replied coldly. It might hurt him, just like you hurt me. Please, Mike, don't make me do this. If you still love me, don't make me, Janet begged. If you truly love me and want to be with me, then this shouldn't be too much to ask, I reasoned. But ultimately, it's your choice. You've changed, Mike, Janet remarked sadly. You're the one who changed me, Janet, I pointed out. Maybe you can change me back. I instructed Janet to email Nick informing him that she was leaving him to return to me and that she never wanted to see him again. While her message wasn't as brief and impersonal as the texts I received, it sufficed. I prohibited her from calling him with any updates and insisted she refrain from contacting him in any manner. I warned that if she even crossed paths with him, she must walk away or our relationship would be over. Let that bastard suffer. Additionally, I informed her that her mother was no longer welcome in our home and she appeared to accept that decision without any objections. The situation seemed oddly smooth right from the beginning. I made a point of assuring Janet that I wouldn't be monitoring her actions and that I trusted her to uphold our agreement, which seemed to help. Honestly, I didn't fully trust her, but I saw no point in causing a scene. About a week later, she confided that Nick had called her multiple times at work, but she refused to answer. Eventually, he deceived her by pretending to be someone else and managed to get through. She admitted they spoke briefly, but stuck to our story, saying nothing about the baby. I simply nodded in approval, secretly hoping Nick was suffering as I had. Janet moved into the spare room as planned, but otherwise we continued living a seemingly normal life like any other couple. Our friends accepted the situation, and apart from a few, they seemed genuinely pleased that we had resolved our issues. Some time later, Janet joined me on the sofa, took my hand, and placed it on her stomach. Can you feel her moving? She asked, her deep blue eyes filled with joy. I couldn't feel anything, but it was perhaps our first intimate moment, and I left my hand there longer than necessary. Later, when we turned on the TV, Janet sat close beside me and leaned against me. When I didn't push her away, she nestled even closer, and we spent the next couple of hours cuddled together on the sofa, like any other happy couple. When bedtime arrived, she took my hand, and silently we ascended the stairs together hand in hand. Passing the spare bedroom, we naturally gravitated toward mine, where we assisted each other in undressing. Janet looked radiant and healthy, a slight bump becoming apparent. We slipped into bed, relishing the warmth and closeness of each other's bodies. No, that night we didn't make love. Instead, we spent the entire night wrapped in each other's arms, it wasn't until morning when I woke up happily to find my wife beside me where she belonged that we even kissed. It took another two nights before we made love, but from then on the spare room remained unused. It was inevitable with the baby on the way soon to claim that space.
Life was good once more, and our troubles felt like distant memories, painful yet bearable. Little Mary arrived at 5.35 on a cold January morning, and suddenly life seemed better than I had ever imagined. I even managed to tolerate my mother-in-law's presence as long as she stayed in her own place. Nick was never mentioned, and if Janet still thought of him, she never let on. My doubts faded to near nothingness, and when we celebrated Mary's first birthday at our home, I even allowed the dragon to attend. I didn't plan to say much to her, but, well, you know. Yes, yes, I know. Life was simply wonderful, thanks to our beautiful little baby Mary. I overheard the old dragon lamenting to Janet as I returned to the kitchen with dirty glasses. It's a shame Nick couldn't be here. At that moment, I froze in place. We don't discuss Nick in this house, Mom, my loving wife responded. Mike would be really hurt. Forget him, Janet, her mother snapped back. He's a southerner and you know I've never approved of him. Lower your voice, Mom, Janet cautioned. All right, Janet, but what did Nick think of the baby when he saw how beautiful she was? My smile faded. What was I hearing? It wasn't a good idea of yours, Mum, Janet continued. Nick isn't interested in babies and it wouldn't have worked out. Besides, Mike is a wonderful father, and I love him. But you can't keep seeing Nick behind Mike's back, dear, the dragon insisted. You need to choose between them. I wouldn't have to if you hadn't meddled, Mum, my wife retorted angrily. You knew exactly what would happen when you pushed me to meet Nick again, just when I was moving on. He's not right for you, that Mike, her mother persisted. If things were different... If things were different, you meddling cow, I interjected as I burst into the room. Janet and I would never have married. Oh my God, Mike, Janet exclaimed, horrified. How much did you hear? Oh God, you heard everything, didn't you? I didn't respond to her at all. I grabbed my mother-in-law by her collar and forcefully escorted her out of the kitchen, past the astonished friends and family gathered there, and ejected her from the front door for the second time in our lives. Without checking if she was okay, I returned to the living room to address the gathered crowd. Sorry, everyone, but this party is over, I declared loudly. I suggest you all leave now and take my cheating wife with you before I do something I'll regret. Some left immediately, while others stood in shock at the unfolding events. You should all leave, Janet interjected. Mike and I need to talk. No way, you bitch, I shouted at her, grabbing her dress, which tore. You're leaving first. There was chaos, you can imagine. Several guys restrained me and one even tried to hit me. Fred, being a big guy, sorted out the situation and escorted me out of the room before things got worse. Looking back, I owe him a lot. Sometime later, Fred brought me back to the living room where I found Fred and Martha waiting and everyone else gone, except Janet who sat slumped in a chair looking miserable. Are you happy now? I yelled at her. Calm down, Mike. Fred said, wrapping his massive arm around me, seemingly to console and restrain me. Let Janet explain, Mike, Martha interjected. It might not be as terrible as you think. As terrible? I exclaimed. It's far worse than terrible. He's right, Martha, Janet interjected. I've been foolish again, terribly foolish. Damn right, I shouted at her. What do you have to say for yourself? I'm so sorry, Mike, she cried. I won't even ask for your forgiveness because I know you won't give it. But Janet, Martha started only to be cut off. It's no use, Martha. I've let Mike down again and he knows it. I can't expect him to understand. You should leave, Janet, I told her angrily. You're not welcome here anymore. What about Mary? She pleaded. She stays with me, I insisted. But I'm her mother, Mike. You should have thought of that before, I retorted. Where are you even going to take her? Your lover won't have her, and if you take her to your mother's, I swear I'll burn her house down. He's right, Janet, Martha agreed with me. Come back with us for tonight, and we'll sort this out tomorrow. I'm so sorry, Mike. Oh, God, I'm so sorry, Janet sobbed, looking back at me as Martha and Fred let her out. I only met him a couple of times. I swear I didn't sleep with him. 
I'm sure you're sorry, I spat as I slammed the door shut on all three of them. If it hadn't been for little Mary, I would have ended up heavily drunk that night. Honestly, there's only so much a person can take. But by then, I had responsibilities, didn't I? Things had shifted. I did have a few drinks, but then I headed to bed, bringing little Mary's cot into my room where we slept side by side. She was completely unaware of the upheaval about to unfold in her young life. As for me, well, the less said, the better. Oh, God. Here I was again. But this time was different. I was determined not to lose Mary without a fierce battle, though deep down, I didn't think it would come to that. As it turned out, I opted not to pursue a divorce, leaving that decision to her if she wanted it. Instead, I pursued a legal separation, which was both cheaper and quicker. My primary motivation was to secure custody of young Mary. When the judge heard all the details and Janet didn't object, there were no issues granting me what I sought. Hello, Mike. Hi, Carol, I replied, turning to face her. My eyes couldn't help but take in the sight of the attractive woman before me, particularly her slim figure. How's little Tim? He's doing well this morning, the young mother in front of me replied with a smile. He's finally over his cold. And how's Mary? As beautiful as ever. I said with a grin, glancing back at my baby daughter. But I might be biased. I don't think so, Carol added, settling down beside me. She's lucky to have a father like you, especially after what her mother did. Sound familiar? Yes, this is where it all began. So what comes next? What happened afterward? Keep reading. Keep reading. Carol, I must say, was quite attractive. Although she was considerably younger than me, I couldn't help but notice her. With her beautiful auburn or maybe reddish hair, and her nearly perfect slender figure, she embodied everything a man could dream of. However, the twelve-year age gap between us seemed too significant to overcome. Life as a single working father turned out to be fulfilling yet challenging. Between work and taking care of Mary, I had little time for anything else, but that was exactly what I wanted at the time. I did discover the local park where I encountered many lovely young mothers. After explaining why I was there, they welcomed me without hesitation. They were stunning. Well, most of them were, but since I wasn't actively pursuing anyone, it didn't matter. I simply enjoyed observing and chatting with them. All right, I'll admit I paid more attention to Carol than to the others. I first met her in the park while I was with Mary, and she was walking young Tim. He was such a cheerful little boy, and we instantly clicked, him giggling away and me unable to suppress my delighted smile. Mary's husband had traveled to the Middle East for a security project and returned in a casket shortly thereafter. While the company hadn't completely abandoned her, their support was limited and running out. She needed an affordable place to live and it dawned on me that Mary needed a live-in nanny. That's it. Sorry, I think that's Latin, and I'm not exactly sure what it means. But as an engineer chart mathematician, most of my life, it's a term I've often used. It's like saying you found a solution without much difficulty. Something obvious. There we go. Sorry, that one's French. So, Carol moved in and took care of the kids while I... Well... I went to work to make money. Abracadabra. Is that really Italian? These things tend to sort themselves out. And although Carol and I weren't in a romantic relationship at the time, we were content together. Life was good. The kids were happy. And so were Carol and I. I was really starting to move on from Janet. One evening I sat on the sofa while Carol cleared up after our delicious dinner. My daughter Mary snuggled up beside me, yawning and nearly asleep. Suddenly, Tim decided my lap was the perfect spot. He waddled over and clambered up onto me, curling into a ball, and soon, drifting off to sleep. It was truly a magical moment, and I was not far from joining them in dreamland. Is there room for me there? giggled Carol as she returned to the room. Not unless we put the kids to bed. I joked, expecting a playful response. Well, they're both sound asleep, so we might as well, Carol surprised me by saying, 
gently lifting Tim from my lap. I picked up Mary and together we went upstairs to the spare bedroom the children shared with Carol. After giving them both a goodnight kiss, we tucked them in for the night. You don't kiss me goodnight, Mike, Carol teased me when we went downstairs. She often made fun of me like that, so I answered her with the same stupidity. Am I ugly, Mike? asked Carol after staring at me intently for a few moments. Of course not, Carol, I replied cautiously. You're very attractive. You're not a traditional orientation, are you? She continued, smiling from ear to ear. Hardly. Well, I wasn't like that. So you like me? Well, of course I love Carol, I stammered, realizing that I was treading on dangerous ground. Any man would do that, but it's about age. Is that a problem? Carol asked. Carol, I tried to explain. It's a very big age difference. Okay, that wasn't true, and Carol looked at me questioningly. So, Carol broke the silence, getting up from her chair. Taking off my outer clothes won't bother you, will it? I swallowed hard when she started doing it, and at first my voice let me down when I tried to tell her to stop. Carol, you don't have to, I finally croaked. Then order me to stop Mike, and I honestly promise you that I will never try this damn trick again. I would be too ashamed. Oh my God. Well, Mike, she challenged me. Should I stop or go all the way? A sip. The words wouldn't come out of my mouth, so I just nodded, which seemed to suit her. Take off your high heels or are you feeling a little uncomfortable? She demanded, and a smile lit up her entire face. Come here, honey, I ordered her. The age difference? No problem. And even though Carol was younger than me, she was just as exhausted as I was when we were woken up in the morning by the playful screams of the children. Is it your turn or mine? A beautiful young woman snuggled up to me asked me sleepily. I'll go and fix them up this morning if you don't move until I get back, I offered. A wonderful lover, Carol whispered hoarsely, smiling at me. Today it's your turn, and tomorrow it's mine. Tomorrow, right? And the next day, and the day after that. Life suddenly seemed damn pleasant to me again, believe me. It turned out even better than expected as Carol and I discovered we were very compatible. Six months later, despite initially leaving the decision to Janet, I applied for a divorce. As soon as it was finalized, Carol and I got married. I formally adopted Tim as my son, while Carol, with Janet's approval, yes, she was still in the picture, adopted Mary. Interestingly, Janet continued to visit Mary regularly and got along well with Carol. She even started taking both kids out together. I had made it clear, though, that I didn't want Janet's mother around Mary, although Janet seemed to have little contact with her anyway. And as for Nick the footballer? I never actually met him and have no desire to. I know he didn't marry Janet, but I believe he remained faithful. However, it was clear that my ex-wife's new relationship wasn't going as planned, and her strained relationship with her parents didn't help. I found myself pitying her. Can you believe it? I suppose when you've loved someone like I loved Janet, those feelings don't just disappear. They may fade and lie dormant, but they have a way of resurfacing sometimes at the worst possible times. About three years into my marriage with Carol, Nick had been let go by Stockport. Given his age, finding another decent team would be challenging. His attempts to break into management had also faltered. It was a tough time for both of them, and Janet needed someone to lean on. I don't know how you can be so kind to me, Mike, Janet sobbed, after everything I did to you. It's okay, Janet, I reassured her, holding her close. It all worked out in the end. But I miss you, Mike, she whimpered. After everything that's happened between us, I still miss you. I miss you too, honey, I heard myself saying unexpectedly, and gently kissed her forehead to comfort her. I'm not sure how it happened, but that small kiss soon turned into a kiss on the lips. Before we knew it, we were kissing passionately reigniting the intensity of our past relationship. I couldn't say who initiated it, 
and it hardly mattered. Soon, we were touching, caressing, and tearing at each other's clothes. Soon after, we were both almost without outerwear. I pushed Janet onto the couch. Do it, Mike, she screamed in anticipation. I went to her. What are we doing, Mike? Janet's frightened voice interrupted me. We can't do this, Mike, she insisted, staring at me intently. But Janet, I pleaded desperately. Just once, please. No, Mike, no, she exclaimed, trying to push me away. That's how I ruined our marriage, Mike. I will not let this happen again. But Janet, I pleaded on the verge of losing my temper. Just this once, honey, please. No, Mike. I can't let you do to Carol what I did to you. I, I can't. Her words hit me hard. Please, Mike, get up. Leave me alone, honey. Think about Carol and the kids, Mike. We can't do this to them. We really can't. Oh, my God, what did I almost do? The two of us stared at each other, then I slowly got up from beside her. Quietly, we both retrieved our clothes and dressed. I'm sorry, Mike, Janet sobbed. I just couldn't let you repeat my mistake. No need to apologize, Janet, I said, my heart racing. I shouldn't have taken advantage of the situation. But you didn't, Mike. You didn't, she insisted. But you still have feelings for me, don't you? I nodded in agreement, unable to voice it. But you love Carol too, right? Yes, Janet, I replied. I'm so confused. I don't know what to do. I understand how you feel, Mike. You have to do what I should have done when I was in your place, Janet lectured. Loving two people at once is heartbreaking, but you have to choose your wife, not me. We held each other again, seeking solace in one another, but the atmosphere was different this time. I should go now, honey, Janet finally said, pulling away and gathering her things. Carol will be back soon, she added. Don't mention this, and make tonight special for her. Thank you, Janet, I said sadly. And you should go back to Nick. It sounds like he needs you. I will, Mike, Janet replied, her voice tinged with sadness. He's a good man. He deserves your love, Janet, I told her, feeling the bitterness dissolve within me. I'm older and wiser now, Mike. Janet choked up, tears on the brink again. I think there's only one man I've ever truly loved, and it's not... She trailed off, leaving the thought unspoken. Janet completely broke down in tears and rushed out the door, leaving me with that last thought. What if... But then again I realized I loved Carol just as deeply as I had loved Janet. It was unfortunate that my ex-wife hadn't come to the same realization years ago. For the first time, I empathized with the turmoil she must have experienced back then. Well, that's the conclusion of my story, though certainly not the end of my life. Six years later, I am still happily married to my wife Carol and we are blessed with wonderful children. Tim and Mary and little Freddie and Linda bring us great joy. Janet is the godmother to the youngest two who were born as perfect twins on the same day a couple of years ago. Tim and Mary have delighted in calling themselves twins throughout their childhood, even though technically they are not. As for Nick, he eventually found a good job at a sports center where he seems content and takes good care of Janet. I wish him well, although we have still never met, and I have no strong desire to do so. One more thing. I received a significant promotion three years ago, which required us to relocate to the other side of Manchester. We bought a beautiful Victorian house with four bedrooms in Chapel Heaton, which locals will recognize is actually, well, I hesitate to admit it, but it's Stockport. And you know what? It's actually a lovely, welcoming place. I adore it. Most Saturdays I take young Tim to watch Stockport County play, unless Arsenal is playing somewhere in the Northwest, but please, I implore you, don't tell anyone. <laughs>